Cool. Uh, so this is the technical art of Sea of Thieves. Uh, we have quite a bit of stuff to cover, so I'm going to keep a very brisk pace. Uh, photography and recording is encouraged. Uh, there's going to be bits of code and math, which hopefully you guys can take away and use. And we will try to make the slides available probably from the Rare website in the near future. A uh, little note about our tech art team. So it's split roughly into two halves. We have some people working with content creation tools, creating scripts, uh, doing binding and rigging, supporting the artists. And the other half, uh, we work more with the engine, with shaders, doing viz dev and bits of gameplay code. So this is this talk is very much focused on the work of that second half of the tech art team. And obviously, we can do it without our wonderful and amazing rendering engineers. Uh, so this is the launch trailer for Sea of Thieves. Uh, we released in March. Sea of Thieves is a shared world adventure game. You crew up with friends or strangers and you go out onto the open seas and you get up to all kinds of pirate hijinks. It is very much an open sandbox kind of world where the players can pretty much do whatever they want as opposed to being any kind of more guided experience. So that brings all kinds of its own challenges because everything you do has to be robust and stand up to the players abusing it in all kinds of bizarre ways. If you have a single expensive asset, then you have to be prepared for the players spending 48 hours straight gathering 200 versions of that asset and putting them down all into the same spot and then complaining about the performance. So that's a quick preview of quite a few of the features we'll be talking about today. So the theme of this talk is stylization and simulation. Uh, specifically, uh, at SIGGRAPH, we see a lot of uh, game talks about bringing photorealism and uh, physically-based rendering into real-time pipelines. And we thought it would be interesting to talk about how we combine that with a uh, more stylized art direction. Uh, but hopefully, while we're talking about this, we'll also give you guys stuff that is useful and that you can use in your games and to achieve your own art direction, whether that's photorealistic or stylized. Uh, so there was a talk at GEC this year by Ryan Stevenson, who's our art director at uh, The Art of Sea of Thieves, and he talked about the three art pillars. And this work that we've done very much covers uh, the challenges posed by the first two, uh, the first one is that it's an illustrative approach which most notably affected our work by the fact that we were kind of very averse to high-frequency detail, which goes counter to a lot of the stylistic trends in games. And the second one is a world in motion, which is that we wanted the entire world to be dynamic, to not have any static frames, have things moving and updating and reacting to the player's actions. Uh, just some background, we're using Unreal Engine 4. We started on 4.6 and we stopped taking our days in 4.10. Uh, it's a deferred renderer and our reference platform was the Xbox One at 900p30. So that's what all of the timing captures that you'll see in the stalk are from. However, we also scaled up to native 4K on Xbox One X and we tried to hit as many PC specs as we can. Uh, we use mostly stock UE4 graphics. We do some optimizations and slightly different techniques for shadows and uh, for SSAO. We don't use screen space reflections. We just use planar water reflections for the ocean. We have a fully dynamic time of day, and we use light propagation volumes for real-time GI. Uh, interestingly, during this production, our bottlenecks have primarily been on CPU and memory, not so much on the GPU. Uh, so you might notice throughout this talk that some of the things we've done have specifically been about offloading work from the CPU onto the GPU. And as a result, we sometimes may be haven't optimized the GPU bits quite as much as we might have otherwise, uh, because that was not where the bottleneck was. Uh, so this talk is split up into three parts, so there's quite a bit to get through. Uh, first off, we'll be talking about water rendering, then a little bit about the work we've done on clouds, and finally, some fun things with vertices. <laughs> 
Uh, so let's begin with the ocean, which is the, possibly the most notable feature of the game. Uh, Mark Lucas, our lead rendering engineer, and the rest of the team implemented uh, FFT water simulation based on Tessendorf's uh, simulating ocean water paper from 2001. It's a fairly straightforward implementation, and on the tech art side, we were mostly focused on using the sim data to then develop the water surface shader. Uh, it's not physically based. Uh, we haven't been able to find any particularly good models for doing water surface shading. So our main problem was to how to integrate this with a uh, highly stylized R direction because the highly realistic water that we get out of the Tessendorf FFT method is very noisy, lots of high frequency detail. It doesn't really sit necessarily that well with our art style. We experimented with a few things. We eventually noticed that even in like more stylized CGI movies, the water tends to be more realistic. So we've ended up erring more on that side of the equation rather than making it too stylized. Uh, we mostly stylized the foam, and we also boosted the strength of the subsurface scattering beyond uh, what would be considered realistic to help it fit in with the style. We also tried a few other things, like we did try to simplify the shape of the water, simplify the specular highlights, take away some of that high-frequency detail. But essentially, we found that if we did that, the water looked less good. Uh, so we decided to keep it a little bit more detailed, but you know, keep that uh, wow factor of just seeing pretty water. So for the subsurface scattering, we used the choppiness vertex offsets from the FFT skin, uh, sim to generate a mask for where the sides of the waves are, and then we just use a dot product of the light and view vector for the SSS contribution, and this is what that looks like, along with the uh, specular. And then the bulk of the work is in the foam generation, which we use using the method uh, described in Tessendorf's paper. Um, you take the Jacobian determinant of the transform and generate foam where it goes negative. We inject pixels into a render target which tiles across the uh, tiling water surface. So this is roughly an indicator of where the choppiness offsets cause the wave peaks to overlap on themselves. And then we bias the Jacobian to get more foam. So if the water sort of slice graph looks like the bit in blue, the yellow is the Jacobian of the transform. We just bias that down, we get more bits of foam being generated. That looks something like this when we render them into the render target, which looks kind of nice, but it's definitely far too noisy for our art style. Uh, so what we do is we actually progressively blur the render target. So what you get out of that is that where you have the peaks of the waves, you still get these kind of sharp crests, but then that foam gradually dissipates over the progressive blur frame by frame. Uh, we blend this with artist-authored foam textures. We have a high frequency foam texture at the crest of the wave, and then we blend to a lower frequency texture as it blends out, and then we blend this with the watercolor and... This is most of the water rendering. We also use the same um, water crest where we generate foam to generate some particles off the tops of the waves, but that's basically it. Uh, for stormy water, we just increase the amplitude of the waves and we bias the Jacobian even further to get more foam. That works pretty well. Uh, this is by far the most expensive bit of rendering in the game. Uh, as you can see here, so most of these uh, terms are fairly constant for updating the FFTs and doing the various resolves, calculating normals. Uh, the most expensive bit at the end is where we draw the water surface. That one's obviously mostly pixel shader bound, so it's dependent on how much water you're actually seeing on the screen at one time. Uh, in this case, we're only seeing water, so we're paying almost 8 milliseconds for it, but in that case, we're not actually rendering anything else. So the total frame time in this case was about 20 milliseconds, so we can afford that. Next up, uh, we wanted to do an effect for the deck of the ship, where we have shallow water um, splashing around on the deck generated by the bow waves. Uh, we decided to run a surface water sim. Uh, we're assuming the deck is leaky, which simplifies the fact that the water is never going to get too deep, and we can assume that you know water is leaking away, so we don't need to preserve the volume particularly accurately. Uh, so we use a height field to represent the deck of the ship. Um, this captures like the crevices between the planks. 
It's a fairly small uh, render target, 512 by 192, and we run a two-pass shallow water simulation based on this paper, Fast Hydraulic Erosion Simulation Visualization on GPU. Uh, essentially, it just flows water from points where it's higher to neighboring cells where the water level is lower. Uh, on the first pass, we calculate the outflow for every cell, and because the ship is rocking about on the waves, we use the normal of the surface to actually bias the height outflow um, generation at this step, and this allows the water to roll back and forth across the deck of the ship when it rocks. On the second pass, we gather inflow from neighboring cells and subtract outflow, and the current amount of water gets rendered into the blue channel of the render target. Uh, we also add persistent wetness if the cell contains water, uh, and that's written to the green channel. And then we subtract a little bit of water from the green and from the blue, which means that the water drains away over time and the wetness dries up. Uh, so this is what just the render target visualization looks like of the blue channel. Uh, so you can see it splashes around and it gathers in some of these crevices between planks. Using this, we generate a normal map and we modify the deck material properties. Uh, so we interpolate between the deck normal and the water normal, and then we change the specular and the gloss and the diffuse, and this is what the final result looks like. Uh, in the game, this is then connected up to sensors on the front of the ship, which uh, trigger the bow waves when you crash into a wave on the ocean, and this splashes water onto the deck, and you see it get wet and roll about. Uh, this is very cheap. Uh, this is about 0.2 milliseconds in total to update for a single ship, and we tend to try and make sure we only do it for a ship at a time. Uh, next up, we wanted to have waterfalls and flowing water, and we decided that we want to have a special system for generating intersection foam and also occlusion for waterfalls. So we did this by, again, rendering uh, the geometry to a separate render target. And what we do is we render the mesh, for example, a waterfall mesh, with an unwrapped UV to that second render target, where the UV is the screen position of the mesh. But for every pixel that we're rendering, we still have its screen position in the projection from the camera in the actual scene. So we know what the distance of that pixel is from the camera. And we can also sample the scene depth um, that was rendered earlier in the G-buffer pass. And we actually know what is the distance of like, the nearest solid thing like behind or in front of that pixel. Uh, so this kind of looks like this. So if we have a flat water plane, which is in red in the scene, and we have that white square overlapping with it, if we're rendering this green pixel uh, in the render target, we can sample the scene depth, and we can see what the depth is of that object at that pixel, and we compare it with the distance of the uh, geometry from the camera. And if those, those distances are close enough together, we can render a value into the render target, which gives us an intersection map. So what we get from that is something like this, where we are then able to direct and blur that intersection map over time, and you can get sort of flowing foam being generated by objects that are set with the water surface. So what's happening here is we're additively blending the result with the previous frame. Uh, we advect it and we blur the texture, uh, same as we're doing with the foam. So this is the sort of uh, flow map we use. Uh, you'll notice that only pixels that are marked on screen are updated. So that's also a mass that we uh, generate during that render target pass. And with the flow map is also scrolled. And in the game, we also use this for things like waterfalls. In this case, you'll see that the supports for the bridge actually occlude the water from the waterfall, and this isn't done through geometry or a texture. This is done with uh, real-time uh, depth occlusion. And then we also adapt this into a similar effect for the ocean surface, and that's how we generate a foam mask. In this case, we just have a traveling window for render target around the player. And again, this is progressively blurred, so you get this nice foam trail behind objects that move through the water. But this is also how we generate the foam around static geometry like islands. And then we blend this with the watercolor and with uh, foam texture. Again, this is 
super cheap. This is less than 0.1 milliseconds for something like that waterfall example. So next up, uh, let's look at clouds. So this is the sort of concept art we saw back when we were first starting on Sea of Thieves. And in particular, they wanted to do crazy things like storms that actually sit in the world and uh, pull a rain of sheet around with them. And they also decided that they want to mark up points of interest with things like skull clouds and other differently shaped clouds. So this was an interesting challenge for us to solve. Um, we had a whole bunch of kind of structural requirements in that you have to maintain stabilization and the clouds have to be 3D and they're dynamic and have to be controlled by artists and they have to have a physical three-dimensional position in the world and they have to be cheap, of course. And there were also all the aesthetic requirements, the clear readable shapes, sometimes geometric designs, sometimes sharp lines, but sometimes fluffy edges. Uh, we tried a few things at first uh, before we even started working in Unreal. We experimented with billboards and with sky domes. Uh, we tried out a few different approaches to ray marching the clouds. Uh, we found this was far too expensive, both on the GPU and in terms of uh, storing volumetric textures and memory, uh, especially if you're having things like skull clouds that just becomes quite hard to manage. Uh, with uh, ray marched approaches. So we decided to go a different way, and we were initially inspired by the Paths of Hate uh, short film, uh, which, if you guys have seen, what they do is they have a geometrical core to the clouds and they scatter billboards on that core with uh, painted on brush strokes, which give them a very stylized uh, painterly appearance. And we really like that, and we tried that out in. An early version of the game. This is the art diorama back in Unreal 4.6. Uh, this looked nice in some cases, but for a lot of them, it didn't actually fulfill the style requirements that well. And more importantly, we found that although that approach works well for offline rendering, in our case, for real-time rendering, uh, you have, first of all, the issue of sorting all of those billboards. And secondly, even though there's a core geometry to the cloud, on the edges, you end up having a lot of overdraw, so it was actually still rather expensive. So how do you make solid geometry look fluffy? And more importantly, how do you do it cheaply? Uh, we went back and forth in this and eventually came up with this approach. Uh, so we started out by rendering the clouds into a separate off-screen render target. Uh, and in this case, it's a very simple forward render. And in fact, we calculate all the lighting per vertex. It's extremely quick and cheap. Then we downsample this to quarter res and we run a single pass uh, compute shader Gaussian blur. And a neat trick we do here is we actually change the standard deviation of the Gaussian blur based on the depth of the scene. Uh, this is very rough uh, implementation because we want to make this shader uh, remain very cheap. Uh, you might be able to get better quality results by actually using maybe some kind of depth of field technique. Uh, we actually decide, realized that we want to create a texture which packs both the depth and the alpha, which left us with only two channels for color. Uh, so the red channel is the sunlight and the green channel is the skylight, which is why those clouds had such a weird color. Uh, interestingly enough, if any of you were in the potpourri talk yesterday uh, by Pixar, it's interesting to notice that they export their clouds in a similar sort of way when they're rendering uh, billboards. Uh, so what we also do is we run a box blur on the depth, which has the nice effect that we actually end up with a flat depth kind of on the mid-level clouds. It doesn't, um, it doesn't blend off at the edges. And you'll see why that's useful in a second. Uh, so then what we do is we draw a quad, which is pinned to the frustum of the camera, and we hold it at about 500 meters in front of the camera, which is what we reckon is the closest you'll ever get to a cloud in the game. Um, essentially, uh, the pixel shader then, which gets rendered onto the quad, is the most expensive part of this process, so we want to make sure that we have as few pixels being rendered as possible. And what we do, the reason we do this is that if you have any objects then that come up in front of the quad, they will occlude the pixels behind it. They won't get rendered. And we also do an initial sample of the depth map, and we discard any pixels that cannot possibly contain clouds, which is anything which is not black on this picture. 
So then uh, one of the things that we can do is we can actually use that blurred depth to calculate an approximate blurred world space position. And that's kind of what that looks like in this case. Uh, so you'll see it's not especially temporarily stable. There is some jitter around the edges. Uh, so we definitely wouldn't want to use this for lighting. But we can use this essentially for compositing. Uh, we can do things like we can blend fog in and out based on the heights of the clouds, and we can change the distortion, which we're going to apply in a second. Uh, so then uh, we look up into a cube map of distortion, which has a low frequency noise in the red and green channels, and this high frequency noise in the blue and alpha channels. And using the depth, we can blend between these noises. And as you'll notice, the clouds in the distance, they actually fall off towards the horizon to give the impression of a cloud dome. And you can see that the noise fades off to black. This is because we kill the noise below a certain height uh, where we have features like skull clouds being rendered slightly below the cloud line. We want to not noise them out too much so as to preserve the feature details. And then if we apply this noise to the alpha, we get this kind of result. We also threshold the alpha, again, with distance, so that clouds in the distance appear sharper um, and look like they're further away, whereas clouds overhead remain soft and fuzzy. And then we do this with the red and green channels, which we multiply out by the sunlight and the skylight, and we get this kind of effect. And finally, we just need to apply some fogging, which we can control based on the uh, world space position. And that's essentially how we render clouds. Uh, halfway through production, uh, we decided to add a spyglass. So I brought up the question of what happens if you zoom in and out. And it turns out it holds up quite well. Uh, what we don't do is we don't change the diameter of the Gaussian blur based on the FOV because that would be expensive. But the distortion actually remains constant and you get this nice feature preserver preserving property on it. Uh, so it doesn't look too bad. Uh, this is not especially expensive. So for this scene, this is kind of what the breakdown looks like. And again, the most expensive bit is the pixel shader at the end. And generally speaking, you're only paying for the pixels you see, so it's quite affordable. In total, that scene is about 1.3 milliseconds to render. Uh, we experimented a little bit with the lighting model. Uh, essentially what we do is we bake out some data into every vertex about where the bulk of the mass of the rest of the mesh is. Uh, a side effect of this is that if you have intersecting meshes, they don't know that they're intersecting meshes so you can get seams, unlike you know, if you were doing ray marching, in which case you just step through the whole thing. Uh, but the advantage of it is that it's very cheap. And in this case, we actually ended up using this uh, point light test to do the lightning inside of storm clouds. So the lightning is just a point light that's whizzing around and lighting up the surface of the cloud when it gets close enough. Uh, this lighting rendering is not particularly physically based, so there's definitely room for improvement there, but it's proven to be a fairly robust um, approach. And then finally, we have a couple of cylinders of rain sheets underneath the storm, which we blend in with a rain post process when you go into them. And one neat trick we're actually able to do here is if you look out at the sun, we artificially punch a hole through the rain sheets at every time in the direction of the sun, which gives it a quite a nice uh, screenshotable moment. So uh, the key takeaways from this, uh, which I think might be useful to you guys, is this is basically a domain-specific method of upscaling. And I, we reckon that this could be used on a few different types of source rendering. Uh, we're using it for poly meshes, but it might also be as applicable to particles or even as a way of upscaling uh, low-res ray marching. Uh, it could be useful for VFX. Uh, you could potentially blend it with other translucent particles and geometry by having them read the cloud depth and fade themselves out accordingly. And what we'd also like to do is add some temporal blending, uh, which might also allow us to support the translucency. Uh, interestingly, there's a similar technique in Shader X5 by Benassi and Benassi. Um, it's a slightly different implementation, but very similar in concept, so I recommend checking that out as well. Interestingly, uh, if you decide to use this for kind of near-ground objects, this is what that might look like. 
So because we have the blurred depth, uh, you can actually get very nice intersections with the world. It's, in this case, not physically correct because we don't step through to kind of figure out the thickness of the object. Everything uh, blends fairly uniformly, but you still get pretty nice effects. And when we were first setting up, we were thinking like, oh, you could have you know, giant cliffs that intersect through the clouds, and that would look very cool. We didn't actually end up using that in the game because we don't have any cliffs high enough, but it's an interesting application. Uh, the limitations is that at the moment, because of the cube map distortion we're using, that works very well for this specific use case where you generally have clouds moving relative to the player, but you never have the player moving that quickly relative to the clouds. Uh, if you end up moving very quickly, then you have the distortion kind of rippling through the clouds based on player movement, which you don't want. If the clouds move very fast, it looks like the cloud rippling, so that's... That looks correct, but not the other way around. But you can generate the distortion in other ways. It doesn't have to be a cube map. And you can also get artifacts because of that um, depth blur fall off. If you have things of very different depths stacked together, especially if you have like a solid geometry in between, you can get slight artifacting. We've never found it to be particularly bad. And it's mostly due to the blur hack. And you can also get jittering in those cases, which could be uh, cleared up with uh, some temporal dithering. Uh, finally, uh, let's do some vertex dynamics. So, first of all, uh, we wanted to figure out how to do ropes, because in our game, uh, players directly interact with ship rigging. They can adjust the height of the sails, the rotation of the sails. Uh, we also have the wonderful idea that masts need to fall over when they're hit by cannonballs. Essentially, we realized we had to do a lot of ropes, and we wanted them to be very dynamic ropes because, again, like that art pillar, it's a world of motion. Uh, we didn't want to just have you know, straight lines going everywhere. But simulating rope physics is expensive, um, especially when you have hundreds of rope segments on the screen at the same time. So I had the crazy idea, like, you know, can we solve ropes as an equation? Uh, especially, like, what if we... Take the start point and the end point and the rope length. Um, can we, like, get a curve out of that? Because ropes are parabolas, right? Uh, so uh, after some research, it turns out that ropes are hyperbolas. But there's actually a really neat and simple equation for solving precisely that problem where you have a start point and an end point and you have the length of the rope and you want to figure out what the curve is. But that's actually a transcendental equation, so there's no analytic solution to it. Well, HLSL happens to have hyperbolic intrinsics. I always wondered why. Um, they're pretty slow, but we're dealing with mesh deformation, so we only really need to compute this per vertex. And that horrible equation we really actually need to solve once per rope segment because that gives us the parameter for the hyperbolic curve and then we can just plug that into the hyperbolic equation. So let's try a numerical approximation. So we're trying to solve a function which essentially looks like this where you're plugging in the x which is the 0 to 1 length traveled along the rope segment horizontally and you're plugging in the height between the two points and the length, which needs to be normalized to that, uh, to that rope segment, to the horizontal distance between the two points. And this is essentially the shader code to solve that. So in our case, we use 20 iterations, and that gives us you A, which is the parameter you want to plug into your cosh function. And there at the end, you get the y, which is the vertical displacement down from the horizontal uh, representation of the rope. And you can then plug this into vertex deformation. In this case, we're deforming a ribbon, and we're not doing anything crazy in terms of shading. But you get this kind of behavior, where essentially you can move the points around, but the length of the rope remains constant, so you get this very nice physically correct behavior. Uh, if you move them too far apart, we obviously just clamp the length. Um, because of the approximation, what happens if you move them too close? You get that. <laughs> but that's fine, because if we look closely, we realize that it's actually a very predictable case. It happens when you have a 
specific uh, ratio between the length of the rope and the horizontal distance between the two points. So uh, we're going to tackle that in a second. First up, uh, we're obviously not happy with ribbons. We want to have proper geometric ropes. We want to have normals, and we want to have uh, you know, volume to them. So to do that, we're going to need to grab the hyperbolic derivative, and that gives you the gradient, and from that you can derive the normal, and therefore you can push out your vertices in whatever uh, correct shape you need. Uh, next up, we also want UVs realized at the very end of this, because otherwise, if you just you know, have the naive parameterization of the UVs, you get texture stretching. Uh, we want the correct distance traveled along the curve, which will give us uh, correct tiling. Unfortunately, the arc length is not a pretty function. And we have to evaluate this twice, um, once for x0 and once for well, each x, uh, every vertex along the point. Uh, but that gives us length traveled. And now that we have the normals, we have the correct tangent space for the surface of the curve. So you get actually these nice, you know, perfectly correctly normal mapped ropes, which you can deform and move around, and they, you know, they, they preserve the length of the rope. So next up, now that we have this, uh, we can chain these rope seg segments together and can create rope systems. Uh, essentially, in this case, what we want is for the length of the rope to be the product of the distance between the two points. And when the position between the points changes, we can just propagate the length offset through the system. So we can get essentially systems of pulleys where the rope runs through the pulleys and everything kind of looks correct. And to solve that horrible case of the precision breaking down, uh, we just cheat and we tighten the rope to a straight line when we realize it's approaching a problem case which is fine because we just propagate the offsets and it looks like the rope is spooling up. Uh, so here's an example of a rope and pulley system. Uh, if you guys can see, when the block at the bottom moves, which is the anchor, the rope ends up reeling through all of the pulleys and everything's being updated kind of correctly. So you always have one end of the rope system, which is kind of an infinite reel, which reels the rope in and out uh, as necessary, and the other is the anchor, which moves everything around. So as you, as you do this, uh, we've also added like a little bit of wind sway. Uh, you could do this probably quite correctly by rotating the entire arc around the axis uh, between the two points. We're not doing that, we're just adding a bit of a sine wave. As you can see here, that what that rope at the top is doing is it just, it's turning into a straight line as soon as, uh, as soon as we know that there's going to be an issue there. Uh, for in the distance, we switch to a much simpler rendering of the ropes because we don't need to calculate proper normals. And we use the phone wire AA from uh, experiences from Avalanche Studio uh, in 2012. So we change the thickness of the ropes and we change the translucency. So you get this naturally anti-alias looking uh, representation. And this is what the final result looks like when you're on the deck of the ship and you move, changing the rotation of the sails. You get all the ropes kind of correctly rolling through the pulleys and adjusting themselves based on the shape and the angle of the sails. Uh, so on the Xbox One, if we do a naive implementation kind of according to the shader code I showed earlier, uh, you get about 0.035 milliseconds per a rope of 65 verts. Um, we mostly use uh, square cross sections for the ropes. Uh, that tends to be good enough, although we do actually tessellate them when we get very close, which is scary, but it works. Um, in practice, we've actually moved a lot of that uh, pre-calculation of the transcendental doing the iterations onto the CPU, and then we render a bunch of the rope segments in parallel as instant static meshes. And it's a bit hard to actually get a good cost estimate of what it is per segment of rope, but it is very, che very cheap. Uh, next up, tentacles. So this was work we did quite late, um, kind of pretty much just in the rush to release. 
And we re had a design that required Kraken tentacles to wrap around ships. The animation graph is slow to evaluate on the CPU, and we wanted lots of wrap variants, and we wanted to make sure the tentacles didn't clip through ship geometry. So we decided to take approach from the uh, Finding Dory 2 talk um, on Finding Hank and how the Pixel Guys simulated uh, a squishy octopus and had uh, animator-driven uh, deformation coupled with simulation. So we decided to try a similar thing and have Houdini drive uh, an FEM sim. And then we export this to per vertex texture animation. You could potentially also do uh, some kind of um, skinning solution, kind of like the Uncharted guys do, where you convert vertex animation to an arbitrary skinned mesh. That would be uh, more efficient in terms of memory usage, but it wasn't really usable for us because of the CPU constraints. Uh, texture, shader reads texture animation for normals and positions. So you, thanks to the FEM sim, we get this kind of displacement of the tentacle out from the ship hole. And there's 19 wrap animations, so this saved our animators a lot of time because they essentially could reuse the same animation for the different tentacle placements, which were design-driven. And we just run the simulation, we get the correct interpenetration. Uh, for every animation, we actually uh, save out several different states, states and we have essentially keyframes which you can use to transition between, the, uh, between these states which are sort of identical. So there's a wrap begin, wrap loop as the tentacle sits around the ship. And there's also wrangle when it's pushing the ship about and it's kind of moving around a little bit more. So we want to be able to blend between all of these things. We export two textures. We have a 16-bit position data and 8-bit normal data. And then we also actually pack uh, some tangent information to the alpha channel. Uh, we also have a lot of version with fewer vertices and fewer frames uh, for when you're looking at the tentacles wrapping around the ship from a distance. And because we're interpolating the frame data, we actually export only 117 frames of the original 900 frame animation. And this is the first uh, several tentacle wraps we shipped the game with. Now we actually have another seven because we've added a new ship type. And that was a very simple process of re-exporting, uh, rebaking re more wraps for a new ship. Uh, and one neat trick we found along the way is we can actually blend, bake blend shape data into tangent space. Uh, often if you want to have state changes for a mesh and you want to do it cheaply, what you can do is you can bake a blend shape into the UVs of the mesh and in the shader uh, switch the local position between the baked position data and the UVs and you can get a uh, simple blend shape transition, but you can't normally do this if an object is skinned. And um, sometimes you don't want to pay the cost for blend shapes in the animation pipeline. We certainly didn't. So what we found is you can actually save out the displacement for every vertex and tangent coordinate frame, and that gets updated by the skinning for free. So for example, uh, this is actually a skinned version of the tentacle, and this is an exaggerated version of the suckers kind of puckering in and out. And we also use the vertex colors to displace uh, the blend shapes so they don't all do it uh, in sync. And we also ended up using the same effect to animate the gills on the megalodon. And finally, uh, we realized we want to do something fun with lightning. I'll go through this one pretty quickly. Uh, essentially, we have an L system we generate in Houdini and we generate several versions of the L system so that per vertex we bake out data on how far you have traveled along the length of the L system, and we also bake out data which tells us which branch is the main branch. And the result of this, if we slow the lightning effect down, is it looks quite close to the uh, slow motion videos of actual lightning strikes in that we basically threshold through the uh, traversal values on the geometry and then once we get to the end, we make the main branch very thick and bright, and that gives the effect of that lightning bolt as it finds a grounding point. All pirate life is here on the Sea of Thieves, and you can live yours however you want. So rally your crew. So that Swear was your own. actually uh, completely unplanned. The video guys had been doing about several hundred takes and they just happened to have one where the lightning accidentally struck the ship at exactly the right time. So, in conclusion, uh, 
basically, our approach has been that stylized art essentially has a physical basis. Um, stylization for us is taking physical phenomenon and adding a stylistic interpretation. Uh, we have tried to maintain a physical grounding for all the workflow improvements that gives us, and the simulation allows us to iterate and to create kind of more versions of all this excellent stuff. And an excellent demonstration for that is the vomit that we developed for when your pirate gets very, very drunk. And so we ran several simulations in Houdini, and what we did then is we baked out these simulations to Athos, which we can threshold through, and you get this wonderful result where you have physically accurate vomit splatter. I'm going to skip through the future work, but essentially we just want to do uh, more simulation -y stuff and also give more artists control for this uh, because the, in the way we've done this on Sea of Thieves is this has mostly been stuff developed just within the tech art team as kind of feature key moments. Uh, we want to give artists more control, uh, some acknowledgments, and also we're hiring in our absolutely gorgeous countryside studio in the middle of rural green England. It is absolutely beautiful, though it's looking a bit scorched at the moment. And feel free to contact us if you have any questions, and there's some references at the end. Thanks, guys.